Hello, welcome to Zelf on the Shelf. Um, I'm Tanner and today I'm joined by Chad Anderson, who is the resident expert therapist <laughs> for polyamor polyamorous relationships. Not only that, I'm sure you do other things as well. You, that's just kind of, you told me you were... Yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, I have a local therapy practice and uh, my primary area of specialty is seeing uh, people who uh, live polyamorous lives or non-monogamy lives. Mm -hmm. And I was recently called by someone the polyamory guru in town, although there are other therapists who there do the same thing. There we go, there we go. Chad's also, um, uh, he's, he's just doing a lot of things. He's the author of the book called Gay Mormon Dad, which we'll put the link in the description box below. And also the organizer producer of a local event here in Salt Lake called Voices Heard where local writers come together and share memoir style stories. It's a really, really cool event. Lots of laughs, lots of tears. Um, how long have you been doing that? Two years now, and Tanner's read with us a couple times, so yeah. yeah. Very fun. So Chad, um, I, let's just get down to the thing. How did you get into therapy? <laughs> um, so I, uh, I left Mormonism in 2011, but I've been a social worker since 2002, if you count kind of college intern experience. So coming up on 17 years now, and I've worn lots of different hats, but when I moved to Utah, I opened a practice um, and started kind of specializing in LGBT issues and uh, kind of faith transition issues. And at a certain point, I started seeing some uh, clients who are non-monogamous and then word of mouth traveled. And so that's kind of been the, the bulk of my practice over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And people don't come to me necessarily because they need help learning how to be poly. It's just that they are polyamorous and they want to go to someone affirmative. So they can work on their depression or relationship or anxiety issues, whatever it is. But when you're living a particular lifestyle, you want to see someone who's non-judgmental. Totally, um, totally. So yeah, so I kind of, I see people for all different myriad of reasons, but um, kind of under that umbrella of non-monogamy. What do you think are some of the um, advantages of polyamorous relationships? And I, I don't mean to frame it like, I hate it when people are like, oh, polyamory is this like enlightened thing that like sure. everybody will be doing eventually. It's like, no, you're either into it or you're not. Counterpoint argument, I think everyone is polyamorous. Mm. So let me, let me talk about what I mean by that. So um, humans are naturally instinctually attracted to a lot of different people. Mm. Most people have some attraction to both genders. You're not attracted to every person, but most people experience that level of attraction. So even if you are in a committed monogamous relationship, you are regularly sexually attracted to other people. So it's not like you uh, turn blinders on at a certain point. So I think we're all, in a sense, biologically inherently polyamorous. The monogamous model is, well, you just, you know, turn off your eyes as much as you can right, right. and pretend you're not attracted to other people. So the definition of, of relationship. the definition of, uh, definition of monogamy then becomes, I am sexually committed to one person. Mm -hmm but it doesn't mean I don't notice other people or that I don't watch pornography or that I don't have fantasies, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, sure. So I grew up Mormon in Missouri and Idaho and then moved to Utah as an ex-Mormon. So I moved here speaking Mormon, but not Utah. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's an element of this for all Mormonism, but particularly in Utah, monogamy seems to be the guy who's 21, 22, who's marrying the girl who's 18, 19, 20, and they've never had sex. They've never really talked about it. And suddenly they're thrown into marriage and they may be very well compatible or they may not be compatible at all. They don't have anything to compare it to. And so there's a lot of sexual pressure for performance and desire and in any relationship, sex and chemistry and timing and libido are big issues. But when you have these couples who kind of start out really young, then there's usually a few babies that come along really quickly. While the guy's going to school and getting into a lot of debt, and so you have this kind of state full of people who by the age of 25 have two or three or four children and he's working all the time and at church and their credit cards are maxed out and she's depressed and he's addicted to porn and whatever, like whatever the case may be. And their marriage may stay like that for decades. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably just described like 40 couples off the top of your head that, oh, you, could, yeah. that you could name really easily. Oh, yeah. Um, both in and out of our own families, I imagine. So when you have people in Utah who are kind of learning how to be polyamorous, usually they're leaving some sort of system behind in which they've been living under these pretenses of what monogamy should be, mm -hmm. right? And in, in Utah, in, in Mormonism, you have this kind of shame concept. So if you are living a particular life, your life should look a certain way. 
you're supposed to be happy if you're going to church, feeling no pressure, everything is wonderful, you're being blessed by the Lord, but in reality, you're depressed and stretched thin and the kids are too much and I can't pay my debts off, so what's wrong with me, what did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. So like, there, there's all of this like pressure that builds on people. So the polyamorous community in Utah has people who are super accustomed to like, uh, feeling shame all the time. So people who are poly here often are coming out of these models mm -hmm. of, uh, of pressure and depression and shame. And so Utah's a really complicated place to be polyamorous sure. <laughs> or gay. Gay dating here is really similarly complex. So as a preface to all of that, the advantages to being polyamorous. Uh, poly is a particular uh, branch of the tree. Um, there's a lot of different categories. Poly is not necessarily the same as uh, being a swinger, for example. Mm -hmm. Some couples who are poly add a third sexual partner to their relationship from time to time. Others actively and openly date other people uh, separately from each other or together. Sometimes one partner is monogamous while the other partner is polyamorous. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have single people who are dating multiple people and they all know about each other. So there's a lot of different types of polyamory out there. Um, and so there's not really a right or wrong way to go about it, except that you have to do it from a place of integrity. Mm -hmm. So what I see a lot of people doing is, like, we're not happy things aren't working, let's try being polyamorous. <laughs> there's that Arrested Development line, it might work for us. <laughs> well, did it work for those people? <laughs> no, it never does. I mean, these people somehow delude themselves into thinking it might, but... <laughs> but it might work for us. <laughs> <laughs> or, or you have like the guy who's super attracted to the girl at work and he thinks maybe he can get his wife to buy in if he can convince her to be poly. <laughs> That's not gonna work. Both people, it has to be a really healthy relationship to begin with mm -hmm. and then building upon that. The alternative is, it's kind of like saying, we're not happy, let's try having another baby. Yeah. Like it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But whether you are monogamous or polyamorous, cheating is cheating. So for people who are poly, there are usually rules and boundaries and guidelines built in. And so like working within those rules with jealousy and communication and boundaries, it's a really complex system. Monogamy is similarly complex, uh, but less so because there's less people mm -hmm. involved. <laughs> when you start adding more people, you have variable levels of, of um, difficulty and uh, personality, etc. So it gets more complex that way. So benefits are you get to live for who you are. You get to hopefully work on having uh, needs met in different areas and in different relationships. And it means a lot of really deep self internal work. So hopefully you're doing it from a place of like self love and self integrity from a really like healthy couple space. Um, and if everyone is doing that well, then you have a minimal amount of drama. But most people don't do it well. Just like they don't do monogamy well. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> most people just, relationships are hard, right? Right. And like even holding yourself accountable to integrity and communication, etc. And keeping your, your pride in check, your jealousy. It's very easy to become offended and, and kind of pit people against each other, at least within your own hearts, without being able to take a step back and be like, okay, let's check myself. Right. Right, and there are fully uh, systems of oppression that exist in, in polyamory as well. You have misogyny and homophobia and transphobia and racism and all of these things that kind of play out and those are complicating factors in a lot of relationships. Mm -hmm. But ideally, you have two healthy, happy people who love each other and recognize that they can't possibly always meet each other's needs. And so the idea of being ethical the big book that everybody reads about this is called The Ethical Slut. That's the one you pitched to me. I did. It. Great book. It. It's a good book. Uh, and there's a couple of others that are really good. But just this idea of I can't always get all of my needs met by one person. Which and is so... sort of the cultural myth that we have about monogamy, that especially within Mormonism, that you know, you work your whole life, you find the right person, you know them for maybe less than a year, <laughs> um, and then you get married and you're supposed to be happy with them for all eternity. Right. And it's like, th this wasn't a match made in heaven, really. It's just, you're just two different people with different interests, right, different right. likes, and, and to me it seems outrageous to assume that one person could meet all of my needs or that I could meet all of someone else's needs. Well, and a, another flaw in that thinking regarding monogamy or polyamory is the failure to recognize that we are always changing. Mm -hmm. I am different at 22 than I was at 21. For in fact, I'm different in June than I was in January. Mm -hmm. My needs change, my consistencies change. I'm a dad, 
as I look at my kids, like my relationship with my children has expanded a million times over the course of their life, like infants to toddlers to children. Like I'm changing and growing with them mm -hmm. and I'm changing and growing with my partners as well. So we have to be able to adapt within relationships. What we need sometimes is not what we will need later and our partners are changing and adapting too. Mm -hmm. What are some tools or methods that people who are interested in polyamory should keep in mind? As far as keeping things healthy, you said most people don't do it well. What are some of the, the key factors that determine whether a polyamorous relationship works or doesn't? Right? Polyamory requires every person to be really good at knowing themselves well and holding themselves accountable. Honesty and integrity and clear communication and patience. I will have couples who will come in and want to start being poly and I won't recommend that they actually start dating or sleeping with other people for months mm -hmm. and often they end up anyway doing that <laughs> but um, until both partners are ready and valid and consistent it's uh, it's very complicated along the way healthy communication patterns uh, healthy spirituality healthy sexuality um, this kind of recognition of understanding the complexities and changes of life and I know I'm being like super broad-based but mm -hmm. but for each person that's what it looks like mm -hmm. uh, there may be couples that uh, have been married 30 years before they decide to be poly or couples who are poly for a long time and then choose to be monogamous I've seen Jack and Jill who are married and then uh, Jack decides to have a baby with Teresa But he's married to Jill and so Teresa moves in but all three of them are dating other people <laughs> Like poly can get real complicated real quick. Yeah, especially especially with kids. I imagine right, but it's also just a lifestyle mm -hmm. we want to like raise our eyes and, and be super shocked and, and uh, titillated and outraged mm -hmm. by it. But it's just, a, it's a normal way to live. And normal, I think, is the good word there because monogamy really is a recent institution. Polyamory or, you know, non-monogamy goes back really far into our human heritage. You know, we had this idea that, oh, mo monogamy always and forever, and then there's these weird people on the fringe doing these polyamory things or, you know, whatever. And it, But really, the reality is we've been that for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's a generation cultural shift happening, too. So when we take, like, our parents' generation, which is kind of like 1950s, America model Donna Reed the man works and the woman stays home and yeah, raises yeah. the kids right like that's the that's kind of the culture that Mormonism still kind of is trying to hold on to real tightly mm -hmm. the idea of being attracted to someone else or saying you're attracted to someone else is like oh you're going <laughs> to you're going to hurt you're going to break everything it's it's terrible what i see happening now with uh, kind of this millennial generation which i'm on the older end of but still um, one of us <laughs> <laughs> which i'm fine with but i see people when they're single they're dating a lot of different people, mm -hmm. but they're looking for one monogamous relationship. So you see people who are dating with, uh, dating or sleeping with multiple people while still kind of looking for that relationship that mom and dad have. Mm -hmm. Those people are polyamorous. <laughs> right. They're not using that term, but even for Mormon kids, most of them are not having sex, we think. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but they're still dating multiple people until they find that one. Like until you commit to that one person, you're probably ever is. Mm -hmm. So there's this idea of relationship status change once we settle down, quote unquote. Being poly though is really complex. It's really complicated. It's uh, it, it's it's ever changing. I, I mean, I could give a thousand like case examples, yeah. but uh, I, we, let's say we have Jack and Jill. Uh, Jill has realized that she's bisexual. They have a girl over a few times and share a partner and everything is fine. And then Jill wants to start dating the girl. And Jack is super cool with that. He thinks it's great. But after a couple months, Jack would like to start dating someone. And Jill is super not okay with that. Mm. And so what happens in the relationship at that point where he's fine with her dating other girls, but she is not fine with him dating other girls? And is that fair? And how do they overcome that? I mean, that's one of Good question. One of the million <laughs> examples. So those types of things have to be worked out organically because mm. the the communication and consistency. Tom is dating two girls. Which one does he spend Thanksgiving with? Which one does he introduce to mom? How does the other partner feel? So, so even in situations that work really well, they can become really complicated really quickly. Um, but there are a lot of systems that work uh, perfectly, where it's very organic. Um, you just have to grease the wheels sometimes <laughs> to keep things flowing smoothly. Yeah, you definitely have to be comfortable in the ambiguity 
And I think as ex-Mormons, we have to learn to do that because you have all these rigid answers that are always there and, you know, just the primary answers for how to be happy and how to make your life work. And then once you lose all that, you kind of learn to have to be okay with shifting sands beneath your feet and know that, you know, things are always in flux. Another thing you mentioned is communication, which, you know, nobody's perfect at, me especially, (laughs) but uh, I think that's for any relationship and especially what polyamory does is forces you to have to communicate everything. Six or seven years ago there were all those memes going around like uh, what my mom thinks I do, what my friends think I do. Do you (laughs) remember those? (laughs) And it ends with what I really do. You could find this online. There's there's one about polyamory where it's uh, what what my friends think I do and it's like a group orgy in the picture and what my mom thinks I do and it's like a picture of uh, a polygamous man with six wives. (laughs) But when it gets down to what I really do, the image is like this really complicated, color-coded Google calendar Mm. where it's like how I'm budgeting my time between multiple people. And Uh, and really, that's what it looks like. uh, Every every one of my poly clients, I think, has these like really consistent, here's how I spend my time with who. It, it's it's funny in that way, but it's also very complicated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of work. It's not just about uh, sleeping around. No, no, and and it is a lot of work. I'll uh, euphemistically refer to uh, one couple. Um, again, we'll I'll call them Jack and Jill, who have been successfully polyamorous for a long time. They share partners. They have an open policy that they are allowed to sleep with whoever they want as long as they have permission first. Mm. Uh, and one night Jill comes home and says, oh, by the way, that date I went on last night, I ended up sleeping with him, but she didn't have permission first. Mm -hmm. And even though they're constantly sleeping, not constantly, but they're occasionally sleeping with other people, uh, Jack is suddenly horrified and upset because she's now broken the rules. Mm -hmm. So is he allowed to go do that now? Like, how do they process through this? Do they take a break afterward? Like, even even these situations in which there are um, really open standards, Uh, when you don't follow the rules, it becomes very complicated for people very quickly. Mm -hmm. Threesomes alone are enormously complicated. (laughs) If if the third partner is only interested in one person and not the other, Mm -hmm. or if the couple is fighting when the third comes over, or if the third's not really into either of them, like there's there's all of these things that can make it really complicated. The idea of a threesome to most guys is like, yes, you know, but (laughs) but the reality is often not what you would expect it to be. glamorous. It can be, (laughs) but it often isn't. Are there any like basic rules or is it kind of really case by case people figuring out the exact type of relationships that they want? It's absolutely case by case uh, and it changes over time. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a podcast out there that's actually really quite popular called Multi Amory and it's been running for several years and they have podcasts basically on every version of this topic at this point. How to handle jealousy, what happens when one partner is interested and one is not, mm-hmm. how to have relationship inventories, and, and these, these rules that are there. Um, th- there's information out there is what I'm getting at, but, but it's, it's just very organic and, and shifting. Th- this, the standard model that I see most in Utah, uh, there's a lot of gay couples who are polyamorous, but they don't use that phrase. Um, I know a lot of gay men who are in like, consistent, long-term, connected relationships who sleep with other people mm-hmm. uh, within the boundaries of their relationship. So the, re- the, the relationship rules might be don't ask, don't tell, mm-hmm. like, which is fine as long as, that's, Everyone's as long as everybody is agreeing. When it comes to heterosexual couples, I most frequently see um, men and women who are dating opposite genders a lot, or women who are openly bisexual and dating women while still married to their husbands mm-hmm. who are also dating women. Yeah. But I least frequently see straight men who are identifying as bisexual. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you add all of the Mormon baggage onto that, <laughs> it, it's, it, it makes for, it, it's, it's situation by situation. A true clusterfuck. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but but it, it is, it's a, it's a complex situation. Um, uh, if one partner starts to fall in love with another partner, and love is not allowed, or if you're in love with more than one person and one person is more jealous than the other or is mm-hmm. starting to demand more of your time uh, or if one person's too needy or like there, there's so many complications um, mm-hmm. along the way. I'm making this sound really fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what it boils down to. Like well, this is the work we're doing. But if, if we simplify this, let's say you are, let's say you, Tanner, are a single man out in the dating world looking for a monogamous relationship. Mm-hmm. You may see someone that you find attractive initially, but then realize they're boring. 
or they're too aggressive, mm -hmm. or they still live with their mom, or they have too much debt, or you do decide to sleep together and she doesn't have the same sexual energy you mm -hmm. do, or she doesn't like kissing on the mouth, or like whatever it is, or there's a lack of self-confidence. Eye kissing only. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's a thousand things that attract you or repel you mm -hmm. from a given person. And as relationships build and develop, uh, when you first start to become invested in someone and you're excited about them and you see them in there, you can't wait and it's, you're, you wait for the text message to come back and mm -hmm. there's that initial like sexual chemistry. We know what that feels like too, like that building of something. Mm -hmm. Infatuation. Yeah. Right. This is the biggest thing in polyamory, uh, in books and in, in things that you read. It's called NRE, so it stands for New Relationship Energy. So this kind of budding romance, honeymoon phase period, mm -hmm. that's a wonderful feeling. Yeah. It is finite. It wears out at a certain point. But and boy, is it one hell of a drug. <laughs> right. well, but the type of love that you experience with someone changes at mm -hmm. that point. There's that spot where you're like, okay, we've slept together seven or eight times. If we keep going this way, we're now in a committed relationship. Do I want that? Can I overlook the fact that she has credit card debt and lives with her mom? Right. Like, can I buy in here? And so the NRE is finite. It eventually wears off. But the biggest threat to ongoing standard relationships is NRE. Mm -hmm. So when you have Jack and Jill who've been together for five years, the NRE is probably gone and they're in a routine and they snuggle up and they date and they travel and they love each other very much. But now Jack is real excited about Sylvia all the time. Mm -hmm. And he's sitting next to Jill at home and he, he's checking his phone constantly and he doesn't want to have sex with Jill because he's planning on having sex with Sylvia tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, those, those levels in relationships are, uh, are the biggest threat, but they're also the really biggest joyous parts of, of a lot of new relationships. Definitely. Um, and then so it's probably easy for, for Jack to then look at Jill and be like, feel that repulsion because it somehow justifies the, well, he or can. feeds into. He can. What I see happening more often is that he's treating Jill with um, kind of a callousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like she's always there. Mm -hmm. It's okay for me to be excited about Sylvia because Jill's here mm -hmm. and it's fine. And so she's feeling taken advantage of or taken for granted. Um, and it becomes complex. Mm -hmm. So there can be fault finding, but what I see more often is this kind of taking for granted. Sure. And then uh, maybe Sylvia wears off and he decides not to see her anymore. And a couple weeks go by and now Jill is super excited about Thomas, you know, or whatever the case may be. I also see situations that get real messed up real quickly. Like Jack and Jill, Jack starts dating Sylvia, and then Jill starts dating Sylvia. Mm. And then Jill's boyfriend Thomas also starts dating Sylvia. <laughs> and like, it, it, can, uh -huh. it can get really enmeshed because that kind of NRE feeling when you see someone new, it's like, woo, like let's, uh -huh. uh, let's, all, let's all jump in on this. Because um, again, we're presuming everyone is mentally and emotionally stable. Mm. And that is not always or often the case. When you have someone who's depressed or needy or codependent, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It, can get, it can get pretty sticky. But NRE is a really big deal in all of this because that's a wonderful feeling. No matter how long you're with somebody, being with someone new is either really exciting or real awful. It's the subject of every pop song that's ever been written. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And both like sexually and uh, just on an interest level. Right? Mm. It's, uh, it's fun to be involved with someone. So how does, how does a person go into NRE without uh, experiencing that callousness or, or you know, seeing their previous relationship crumble because of it? Uh, it's it's kind of a learned behavior or a learned habit. Mm -hmm. um, we have to break bad behaviors and break bad habits. When I talk about things like this with clients, I often use like nutrition examples. If I've been eating too much for too long and not exercising, I'm going to put on some weight. And the more weight I have on, it's when I change my habits, the longer it's going to take me mm -hmm. to break those patterns and take that weight off. So when we're when we're breaking patterns or breaking habits from communication or spirituality, it, it, it's a pattern of removal and consistency. Uh, once I've gotten healthy, once my nutrition is on point and I'm exercising regularly, easier to sustain. It's easier to sustain, but it's also easy to fall back on old patterns. Mm. So communication, knowing ourselves, holding ourselves accountable, dealing with NRE, uh, handling multiple relationships, all of that comes from a place of practice mm -hmm. and consistency. Uh, it's a way of communicating. Um, 
I, uh, if my, I, I'm partnered, and if my partner rejects me one night and I get my feelings hurt, I have to choose how to handle that. Mm -hmm. Do I say, you know, fuck you, I'm mad, and you <laughs> walk away, or do I give him the silent treatment, or do I kind of calm down and say, hey, that hurt my feelings? Mm -hmm. Like, that's part of any relationship, learning how to communicate and navigate through that. But I have to do that work internally mm -hmm. before I do it externally. And then I hope that he's doing that same kind of work. Yeah, and it's, it's a trust. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and then, again, with polyamory, it becomes more complicated. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, relationship inventory, which kind of gives me flashbacks from the mission. Companionship inventory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was thinking about that the other day because... Um, because it, it can be valuable to sit down and just have a discussion and, and I guess my fear is sort of, I still maybe have that, some of that lingering romanticism of like, oh, a relationship should just work and you shouldn't have to talk about things and it should just, you know, be easy. But I think there's something to be said about sitting down and, and uh, hashing out what's working, what's not working and um, what are your thoughts on, on approaching an inventory type situation. Again, assuming both people are centered and balanced and good at communicating. Mm -hmm. It's crucial and necessary, but you have to learn those communication patterns. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you're sitting down and I'm saying, I'm tired of you not doing the dishes. And he's saying, well, I'm tired of you not doing this. And it, it like, those types of discussions can really easily turn into uh, what you've done wrong is bigger than what I've done wrong mm -hmm. um, instead of really open, healthy communication. I call it like healthy conflict as opposed to fighting. Mm -hmm. I would much rather have the conversation where I say, hey, you hurt my feelings, rather than letting it build to a place where it's a, a huge fight or passive aggressive, you know, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. All of this is, of course, complicated in Utah by Mormonism. <laughs> because you see people who are, this is a real date I went on. This is, I've, I've told this story a number of times. Um, I did an interview with John Dillon on Mormon Stories. I shared this mm -hmm. then too. Uh, I went on a date with a guy. We'd been chatting for a couple of weeks. I'd only been out. I had two little kids, like a toddler and an infant at home. He knew about them. Um, we went on a date, he was super handsome. And after a few minutes on the date, he introduced me to his partner, which he had not mentioned before. This is the first date? Yeah, first Whoa. date, first meeting, after Whoa. a couple of weeks of chatting. So we brought his partner over, and he they ex proceeded to explain to me how they were, this is before gay marriage passed, mm -hmm. so they were partnered, they'd been together a long time, but they go to church every week, and we're just pretending to be roommates at church, and they follow all of the Mormon standards, except for the law of chastity, because they feel like it didn't apply to them. And they were looking for a third, to be in their relationship, and they, I appealed to them because I had children. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, this is a lot. <laughs> and I ordered a cup of coffee, and they said, could you please not drink coffee? Oh us. my god! <laughs> right? So you see, these, you see these crazy stories with people who are leaving Mormonism, who have various standards they're living, but others they're not. And I, and I don't judge, but it's funny, too. Mm -hmm. So people who are in Utah have a lot of these kind of biases and notions. Um, they've had to fight hard, as you and I have, to kind of stake their claim uh, outside of their own culture and family origin and find yourself. Um, and that requires a lot of identity searching. Mm -hmm. And that's a journey. And everybody in this community is in different places on that journey. Mm -hmm. And what I find with uh, relationships, specifically polyamorous relationships, is every relationship kind of holds up a mirror to yourself to get you at a different angle, see some of your blind spots, and, and in the case with polyamory, you've got several mirrors up, um, which is, for me, a deeply enriching experience. Um, but at the same time, <laughs> sometimes you see a lot more than you're able to deal with at a particular time, or, or I, could, I could imagine that being the case for someone who hasn't done that internal work and is maybe looking for an outside thing, another relationship to maybe heal something that they need to be working on. Right, and, and, inwardly. and Mormons are really good at, there's only one path to happiness. Mm -hmm. If you're divorced, if you're gay, if you're polyamorous, if you're questioning, then you can't possibly be happy. Mm -hmm. And so people leaving Mormonism still have a lot of those preconceived notions of there's only one way to be happy. I can only do it this way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I might be gay, which means having sex with men, but being monogamous and going to church every week is the only possibility for me. Mm -hmm. Or 
the rules don't apply to us with chastity, so we can sleep with whoever we want. But don't you dare but don't drink coffee. But don't drink coffee, we don't drink wine, we follow all the other standards, oh. we pay our tithing. I mean, there's, there's all these negotiations that take place. Mm -hmm. Monogamy does not guarantee happiness. No. no. Polyamory also does not guarantee happiness. Just like having children doesn't guarantee happiness. It's internal, consistent work, no matter what situation you're in. Um, if you are in a monogamous relationship though, and one partner wants to be polyamorous, and the other does not, that's a really difficult thing to navigate. Yeah. Because uh, one partner's hoping the other comes around. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have, again, we'll say Jack and Jill, if you have Jack telling Jill, you are not interested in sex, I want to have sex four times a week, and just never having sex is not working for me. I need to see other people, and she's saying, I don't, want to, I don't want you to see other people, but I also don't want to have sex with you, except when I want to. How do you navigate that? Because neither person is right. Mm -hmm. We're using a gay couple example, if we have Adam and Steve, haha, -ha. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, Adam only wants to be a top in the relationship, but Steve also is a top, and both of them want the option to do what they feel good doing, and they're both saying no to each other. Do they? How do you work around mm -hmm. that? So relationships can become really complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so monogamy doesn't necessarily work, but you can't just start being poly. Right. <laughs> That's why I talk about that kind of weight loss process. Mm -hmm. Like five pounds is pretty easy to lose. Fifty or a hundred is going to take a lot longer. It's consistency and routine, and over a long period of time, one pound a week for fifty weeks. You don't just get to drop it all tomorrow because mm. you've decided to make a change. I think the most common response when I talk to people about polyamory or say, yeah, I'm polyamorous, they say, I could never do that, I'm too jealous. What is your response to that? Well, jealousy is a part of any relationship. Uh, you can be... I see women who react to their husband watching pornography uh, in greater excess than some other women who have learned their husbands have cheated. Mm -hmm. um, when you break the rules of a relationship, including pornography, like you can, you really stand to hurt somebody. Uh, jealousy can come out in a lot of different ways, but it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Jealousy is complicated, and it's, it's a mix of you hurt me and you broke my trust, and this is the harder part to hear. I'm insecure, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm needing validation that I'm not getting from you. So people processing through jealousy have to work both on themselves and on communication with their partner. But if both people aren't doing that, you're not going to navigate the jealousy well. So jealousy is inherent, but it's inherent in monogamy too. So how do you how do you cope with that? You know, someone you see your your spouse or your partner going on a date with somebody else and you just uh, it just rips you apart. What do you do with that? Uh, it, you contract. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a matter of communication and setting appropriate guidelines. Um, uh, if Jill has told Jack it's fine for you to go on a date with Teresa, and then Jill's really lonely and isolated and really struggling, she agreed to it. And so she has to be able to process that with Jack when he comes home uh, and work through that and they have to find a way to communicate and what that means for them moving forward is going to be variable. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not right for Jack just to say, I'm putting my foot down, I'm going on the date, deal with it, mm -hmm. right? There has to be kind of a, a balance between um, contracting and processing emotion. Because that, that feeling is going to be so raw and it's not going to go away instantly and I think Communication will probably help because there's probably these narratives that are running in the person's head. Oh, they're gonna leave me. Oh, they don't care about me. Oh, they don't want me. Um, and if you can establish beforehand, or more realistically, give them that validation. More realistically, not I don't. He doesn't want me, but I'm not good enough. Mm. I've spent my, my whole life. I felt like I'm not good enough, and now I'm not good enough again. Yeah, that yeah. shame processing is a yes. huge deal. Yes. Yeah. On the flip side, let's let's take it. Let's make it a little saucier. <laughs> hey. Uh, Jack and Jill have a threesome with Teresa, and Jill realizes while they are having sex, I haven't seen Jack look at me like that in a long time. Or he, he has more chemistry with her than he does with me. Mm -hmm. Like, those types of things happen too. Sure. So jealousy is inherent, and so processing through that in really healthy ways. Because you're going to get hurt. You're going to get jealous. In any relationship. In any relationship. But again, polyamory is more complicated mm -hmm. because there's other people. There's a huge difference between Jill noticing Jack check out the waitress that just walked by 
and Jill noticing how long Jack is fucking the waitress that they have. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, like totally. it's, there, there's a there's a, a, a huge difference between those two things because it's it's another person and it's intimate. Do you think all jealousy stems from that insecurity? Insecurity is a part of every jealousy, but it's also trust and mm -hmm. regard. So I, uh, I'm a pretty open book, as you can tell, <laughs> but I also don't trust super easily. Mm -hmm. um, I'm careful what I share with people and when I share it. And so when, I, when I'm sharing more of myself with someone and they hurt that, it's very personal for me. Mm -hmm. And that's a form of jealousy, but it's also a form of this person broke my trust. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm wounded by that. Yes. Especially if it's happened repeatedly. I think that's good because um, I hate to say to a person experiencing jealousy, oh, you're just insecure. Sometimes it is a matter of trust that's been broken. It's not necessarily just like, oh, one more thing that I suck at, one more thing that I should be insecure about is the fact that I'm insecure. Sometimes it stems from having been hurt or you know, betrayal in any form. Right. My number one rule in therapy and in myself is a, a, a concept called yes and. And this is getting a lot of traction lately. Um, this idea that two... number one rule of improv, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it's it's the idea that two realities can and do always coexist. Mm -hmm. I love my children more than anything on this planet. If you know me at all personally, you know how much I adore them. On social media, of course, your kids are so born first, funny, they're beautiful, so cute. They're so <laughs> wonderful. And you know what, Tanner? They drive me nuts. <laughs> I need breaks from them constantly. Mm -hmm. I need nights off. I need them to just go away sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's every person. Yeah. If I do this but instead of and, like I love my kids, but they drive me crazy. It's the I love you but thing. Mm -hmm. And I hate that. I hate that. We have to create reality within ourselves that allows us to be both light and shadow. Mm. Both like human and better than human. And and it's really difficult to create that space because we can't use the, oh my children drive me nuts, I'm human, so I can be a shitty human now. Mm -hmm. We have to use it from this place of grace. We have to make our shadows light in a way, but that comes from owning uh, our own inconsistencies. So that's the integrity thing all over again. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got chills. So if I'm feeling jealousy, I have to be able to say, you hurt me and I feel hurt. Mm. It's not a it's not a butt in the middle there. It's both. I love that just like non dualistic approach to life generally. And yeah. I think that's the beauty of of being queer or polyamorous. You know, all these things where we say we let's break down this binary that we've had and say and embrace all sides of it. And being and being a human who holds himself to a high standard. I have to do this work constantly. It's the maintaining nutrition thing, mm -hmm. right? But I have to do this work at eight in the morning and at noon and at four and at eight and at midnight. And then I got to do it again tomorrow. It's not like you reach a place where you just stop being jealous or stop feeling hurt. Do you have any resources that you'd recommend to people who are interested in venturing in or just learning more about polyamory? Yeah, uh, Multiamory the podcast is incredible. It's an easy place to just get free knowledge and resources. They're on YouTube or they have their website. Um, if you want to order books, if you like to read uh, more than two. Another one I read at your recommendation. It's a great Very book. good. Not just for polyamorous people, but like relationships across the board. I found it really helpful. And understanding other people's mm -hmm. relationships too, because they're different. The Ethical Slut is one I mentioned before. Any of Brene Brown's books, mm -hmm. which have nothing to do with polyamory, but everything to do with learning to love yourself. Mm -hmm. so Standing in your power. Daring Greatly is my personal favorite, mm -hmm. uh, and the one I use most often with clients. But just this idea of owning your internal shame and learning how to love. Um, can I speak on that for just a second? Absolutely. Uh, so there's the, I use this in therapy a lot too. Uh, guilt is a healthy emotion. Shame is a pre-programmed unhealthy response. So I'm feeling sad one night. I got stood up on a date maybe and I order a pizza to comfort myself mm -hmm. and I eat the entire pizza and then I feel like shit afterwards. Okay. <laughs> guilt is the part of me that's like, oh my God, why did you do that? This feels <laughs> disgusting. I don't want to feel this way. I don't want to make this decision again. Mm -hmm. That's healthy. Shame is the, oh my God, you're going to die fat and alone. No one's ever going to love you because you just ate this pizza. Mm -hmm. uh, so we like attach our self worth to the events or the things going on around us. Mm -hmm. So in a relationship, if I get hurt by somebody, 
guilt is the, I don't like how this feels. I need to do some work to protect myself or to hold myself to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. Shame is the, that person hurt me. I'm always going to get hurt. I'm never going to trust again. No one's ever going to love me. We shame ourselves and we shame the people around us. Mm -hmm. So the Brene Brown stuff helps us sort that piece out. Does your book, Gay Mormon Dad, delve into polyamory at all? Um, no. It, it, the, so the, this, the mental health and spiritual health stuff that we've talked about here um, uh, is covered really in depth in my book, which is about my own journey mm -hmm. of becoming like a person who hated himself to a person who really likes himself. Um, so the yes and concept, the shame concept, like all of that stuff is in my book. Uh, there is one chapter that mentions a threesome I had once, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't talk specifically about polyamory, no. But I have a number of blogs I've written on the topic, um, so that's... What's the name of your blog? So my, my blog is uh, uh, snapshotsofchad.com, which I named lamely many years ago, but have never changed it. We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on, Chad. Yeah, it's um, my pleasure. I'm sure people will have more questions for you, so uh, maybe I'll sh you can peruse the comment section or I'll send them your way when we get them. Maybe we could do a follow-up uh, if we yeah. have enough questions. I'd be glad to. And uh, and my phone number and email are out there as well. So cool. if there's anyone seeking like therapy or advice, I'm Absolutely. happy to help. And you know, I can't imagine coming at this with, with children or like pre-established Mormon relationships who are now transitioning out of the church and maybe venturing in polyamory. That seems so complicated and I'm sure having a mediator, someone who's well-versed in the in both sides of this, um, I'm sure that'd be like invaluable. <laughs> Inside the box, everything feels so complicated. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm navigating a divorce and I just came out as gay and I have kids, <laughs> that's my story. But outside the box, you can sum anything up in one sentence. Gay guy with kids coming out. <laughs> like, things are things are super complicated or they're not, mm -hmm. depending on how much energy we give them. Um, yeah, so it can that. be or it can't be. Very cool. And, and just because it's complicated or difficult doesn't mean it can't also be fulfilling and exciting. Absolutely. And both. Light and shadow, right? It's uh, sunny one day and snowy the next. Uh, <laughs> we live by seasons. That's how we, that's how we do things. Yes. And thank you so much. <laughs> well, this is Chad Anderson. If you have any questions for him, uh, shoot them to, to us in our comments section. Thank you very much. Have a good day.